Hi, Skippers. Today I'm going to be reading Eruption by Roland Smith, starting on page 104. 7.05 p.m. John, Nicole, and Mark stepped above the tree line just after sunset. In front of them, Popocatapetl's plume shot up into the night sky, thousands of feet above the summit. It looks close enough to touch, Nicole said with awe. It's farther away than you think, John said. It just looks close because of its size. Mark started videotaping. It would be a lot easier for you if you weren't lugging that camera, John said. Well, do you see all the colors in the plume, Mark asked, totally ignoring the suggestion. We couldn't see them during the light during the day, but at night, it's like the 4th of July. Lightning, Nicole said. I see it, John said. Crackling white and gold boats, bolts exploded through the plume like electrified spider webs. Well, does lightning make you nervous, Mark asked. John stared at the powerful column, remembering what Mama Rossi had said. That lightning is still looking for you. It's going to find you again. Reflexively, his hand went up to his hearing. It should make me nervous, he admitted, but for some reason it doesn't. Then he pulled his sat phone out as he said abruptly to Mark and Nicole, Get your headlamps out of your go bags. We'll need them to see where we're heading. He tried the phone. Still no signal. Thomas and Cindy had their headlamps on. They had reached the lake and were drinking the cold water and washing the ash from their faces and hair. I'm worried about that plume, Cindy said in Spanish. The pressure is being relieved, Thomas replied in his native tongue. It is good. What about the lava? There will be lava on the summit, but it is not a problem. It moves very slowly and it hardens before it can reach Lago. Mud flows from melting snow and ice, earthquakes, and flying rocks are what we have to worry about. When I was young, a rock the size of a school bus fell on the village square. It was on a Sunday morning. Everyone was in church. No one died. Cindy pointed across the lake. Are those fires? Thomas nodded. Campfires in the village square. It means people no longer have houses to return to. We should go. Chase stood beside two small beds in the orphanage. They were children's beds, but the adults occupying them did not fill their length. On his left was Mrs. Rossi. On his right was Nicole's sister, Leah. Mrs. Rossi was unconscious. Leah was asleep. The village doctor had been tending to them when Father Al showed Chase into the girls' dormitory. The doctor finished his work and then returned to Chase and explained the extent of their injuries in English almost as good as Father Al's. Both women have broken ribs and severe concussions. Mrs. Rossi has two broken wrists and there is some damage to her neck, but without an x-ray machine or a CAT scanner here, I can't say how bad the injuries are. I have stabilized the women, but they need to be hospitalized. I have sedated Mrs. Rossi, and of course, they are both on pain medication. He looked at Father Al. How are the patients in the church? We lost Mrs. Ruiz, Father Al answered sadly. The doctor nodded. The medical supplies? Very low. We are down to the expired medications. We are boiling cloth in the square to make dressings. The doctor looked at his watch. I had better check on the other patients. Well, and I need to see how the food supplies are holding up in the square, Father Al said. Well, I'll stay here, Chase volunteered. One of the circus people is over in that corner, sleeping, Father Al said, nodding toward the man. Chase looked over. He hadn't noticed the man sprawled on the tiny bed in the dark corner with his knees hanging over the end. I believe his name is Dennis, Father Al continued. He's one of the circus clowns. They took turns caring for the Rossies while the others helped us search the rubble for survivors. The dog trainer even enlisted some of the poodles to help. The little dogs found three people we would have missed otherwise. The poodles were being kept in a large pen on the orphanage playground. The circus people had been asleep when Chase tiptoed up to put Pepe in the pen with his friends. He thought the little dog might start barking and wake everyone, but Pepe trotted over to the pile of his fellow poodles sleeping in the corner and snuggled into them without a whimper. If there are any problems, I'll be in the church, the doctor said. When the girl wakes up, she will be thirsty. You can give her water, but not too much. There is a case of Montana under the bed. It's also important that she and her mother do not move. I've been only able to splint and wrap the broken bones. 
undue movement could cause further damage. In fact, he reached into his pocket and took out some pills. If the girl wakes up, give her two of these. But what are they? They're sedatives, but tell her they're antibiotics. She's been a little difficult, hard to keep down. I was thankful when she finally fell asleep. The best thing for her now is to rest. 108, page 108, 726 p.m. John stopped and pulled the topo map out of his go bag. Are we lost? Mark asked. Well, not exactly, John answered. I just need to check on where we're going. Well, what about the GPS? Nicole asked. Well, you need a satellite signal to use the GPS. John pulled out a compass. We are lost, Mark said. Well, not as long as we keep the plume on our right. We're about here. He pointed to a spot on the map. Here's the lake and the village. He moved his finger. They're above the tree line, so we should be able to see them from this vantage point if they have any lights on. Well, if they have electricity, Mark said. John nodded. That's the tricky part. If the power's out, Lago is going to be hard to spot, especially with all this ash floating around. They'll be using candles and lamps and have fires going in their houses. It's warm up here because of the plume, but down in the village, I'm betting it gets pretty cold when the sun goes down. I realize the plume is entertaining with the colors and the lightning, but we're going to have to concentrate our attention down the mountain to the left. If we miss Lago, we could end up circling the mountain clockwise. I'd prefer not to do that if possible. Circling the drain, Mark said. John laughed. I haven't heard that phrase in years. And you're right. If we miss the village, we'll be in big trouble. They started off again, looking down the mountain, rather than up at the plume. John took the lead, followed by Mark, and then Nicole. Being a competitive swimmer, Nicole had great stamina, but she was learning that walking sideways on a volcano was using muscles she didn't know she had. Her legs and joints were killing her, but what bothered her more than her aching muscles was that skinny Mark, who looked like he'd never seen the inside of a gym. He was lopping behind John Masters with the ease of a mountain goat. Now what about John Masters? She wouldn't be surprised to see him start flying. All he seemed to need, need was a sip of water and something to do, and he was good to go, seemingly forever. She was terribly worried about her mother and Leah. And now Chase, she thought, I can't believe he got robbed in this desolate place. I just hope Thomas and Cindy have caught up to him and that he's okay. What if he's alone in the dark, maybe injured, maybe even... She stopped suddenly and then took a step backward and shined her headlamp down to make sure, hoping her eyes had been playing tricks on her in the dark. They weren't. Back here, she called out. John and Mark were about 30 feet ahead of her. Their headlamps turned in her direction. What is it? John asked. Don't tell me you found another chimp, Mark said. You'd better come look. The men walked back to where she was standing. She hadn't moved an inch. Well, John said. Nicole shined her headlamp down on the ground. My God, Mark said, they have bears here? That's not a bear track, Nicole said, her mouth suddenly dry. It's a tiger track. 7.45 p.m., page 111. Chase sat between Mrs. Rossi and Leah's beds, trying hard to stay awake. The last patient he had watched like this was his father. The doctors and nurses had begged him to go home, but he had stubbornly refused. The only time he'd left his father's hospital bed was to go to the bathroom. He'd even eaten his food in the chair next to the bed, willing his father to come out of his coma. Mrs. Rossi and Leah were pretty like Nicole. The same black hair, the same complexion. With their eyes closed, he could only guess at the color, but he bet they were brown. Except for their height, it was obvious that they were all related. Leah began to stir. Her eyes fluttered open. He smiled. Brown. Well, who are you? Leah asked. The blunt question startled him. He should have been thinking about what he was going to say in the event that she woke up. Well, my name is Chase Masters. You're American? Yeah. Well, what are you doing down here? Well, I'm a friend of Nicole's. My sister, Nicole? She started to sit up and winced in pain. You, you'd better stay down. Okay, is there any water? Chase took a bottle of Montana water out of the case beneath the bed. As he unscrewed the cap, he looked at the colorful label. It featured the lake, the church, and looming behind them, an erupting 
Popo caught the petal. He gave Leah a sip. That's better, she said. Oh, the doctor wanted you to take these. He handed her the two pills. What are they? Antibiotics. He was off to a great start with Nicole's sister. He told him that it was for her own good, but that didn't make him feel better about lying to her. She popped the pills into her mouth and washed them down. You say you're a friend of my sister's? We came down to look for you after we heard about the earthquake. Leah's eyes went wide. Nicole's here? Not here, but she's uh close. Chase had no idea where Nicole was. If they hadn't heard about the Rossies being in Lago, they were probably in Puebla by now. I must be dreaming, Leah said. Chase tried to explain, but it was difficult because he didn't want her to tell her about the hurricane and losing her home. She had enough to worry about. When he finished his abridged story, she asked for another drink of water and seemed to be thinking about what he had told her. She turned her head and looked at her mother. How is she? She's uh, sedated, Leah nodded. We need to get her to a hospital. What are the chances of getting us out of here? Well, not real good at the moment. There's only one road in and it's impassable. Well, then how did you get here? Well, I climbed over the trucks jammed in the gap. I wouldn't want to do that again. I bet. So your friend Thomas is from here and you two split up? Right. We ran into a landslide and I went ahead on a quad to find a way around the slide. He hadn't mentioned that he'd gotten hit in the head and had everything stolen, including the quad. Thomas is Arturo's brother. Arturo? Churro? Chase nodded. And Nicole's with your dad on the way to Puebla. Or on their way back here if they got word that you and your mother are in Lago. He hadn't mentioned Cindy and Mark. That was way too complicated, and he wasn't sure he understood why they were here himself. I'm still confused, Leah said. Actually, I'm shocked. It's not like my dad or my grandmother to let Nicole miss school and her swimming. Weekends are out, too. She's a lifeguard at the local pool. Chase hadn't known Nicole was a lifeguard, but he wasn't surprised. He wished he'd never started this conversation. His mother would have called it a try. Not quite the truth, but not exactly a lie. Nice try, she used to tell him. I know most of Nicole's friends, Leah continued. I don't think I've ever met you. Here we go, Chase thought. Well, I just moved to Palm Breeze. Why would your dad drop everything and come down here to help us? Well, actually, he came down here to help Thomas and his family. It just turned out that you were down here, too. I guess it was fate. Fate, huh? Chase shrugged. What does your dad do for a living? He, uh, Chase hesitated. He rescues people. That's the job? Well, he used to be a Navy SEAL. Chase wasn't even sure this was true. Look, your dad said you'd be shocked when Nicole showed up down here. He said to tell you that Mama Rossi was convinced that Nicole had to come with us or bad things would happen. Leah smiled for the first time. You should have started with that. Well, what else did Mama Rossi have to say? Not much, Chase answered, relieved and wanting badly to keep the smile on Leah's face. She was a little distracted because of Pet's calf. Pet had her baby? Tell me about it. Chase described the birth, leaving out anything having to do with the hurricane, and Leah's smile broadened with each detail. Dad must have been frantic. Chase was certain that Marco Rossi had been beyond frantic, considering he'd been trying to get back to the farm for Pet's labor during a Category 5 hurricane. He was pretty excited, he said. Leah's smile turned into a yawn. Excuse me, she said. I don't know why I'm so tired. I've been sleeping for hours. Chase knew exactly why she was tired and hoped that she would fall back asleep before she asked any more questions he couldn't answer without trying. He's definitely in front of us, Nicole said. He? Mark asked. The tigers on the show are all males. They had followed the tracks for at least a hundred feet. The question is how far ahead he is. John squatted down to take a closer look at the tracks. Pug marks are a little out of my expertise. Pug marks, Mark said. It would be nice if you guys spoke English. Well, pug from comes from the Hindi word for foot, Nicole said. Hindi as in India, where man-eating tigers are from, Mark asked. He's not a man-eater, Nicole said. Not yet, Mark said. Well, what are the circus tigers like? John asked. Nicole looked at the plume. 
The lightning was still cracking, crackling in the black funnel. Out of his cage, in the dark, and the wind of Hurricane Emily, the big lion Simba had been a completely different cat than he was on the show. Ferocious, aggressive, and terrifying. Nicole shuddered. They're fine in their cages, she said, but out here, the tiger will be confused and hungry. He may be injured. In other words, we're in deep trouble if we run into him, Mark said. It would be best if we did it, Nicole agreed. Although at some point, the circus is going to have to try to get him back. We can't leave a tiger running around Mexico. John looked ahead into the darkness. Where do you think the tiger's going? Nicole followed John's gaze. I doubt even he knows. That's the end of page 116. Please check out Google Classroom for your questions on Stormrunner's eruption. See you tomorrow. Bye.